Okay, so the final thing I'm going to do today, I'll try to get it done in 10 minutes, but I'm not promising, um, is to devise the new transformation of space and time. Okay? We said that the Galilean transformation is no good. It's not consistent with the constant speed of light. Okay? Um, and we also said, you know, these length contraction time dilation effects do not agree with the Galilean transformation. Right? Galilean transformation assumed no length contraction, no time dilation. So therefore, we need to ask, well, what is the correct transformation of space and time? Right? How do I relate coordinates as measured by one observer to all coordinates as measured by the other observer? Okay. And you can do it, and that's what I want to do now. And the transformation you get is called the Lorentz transformation. So this is the transformation of space and time coordinates between different observers once you take into account these effects with the correct values of alpha, beta, and delta. Okay. Okay, before I do that, it's useful to define the following constant gamma, which is equal to 1 over beta, which is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. That's just a definition which is used a lot in special relativity. Just believe me on that. So the, again, we're going to do a kind of thought experiment. Two observers, S and S prime, measure the position x or x prime, and time, which means t or t prime, of something. Of an event. Okay, so event is just a general term. Something happens somewhere in space, and two different observers measure the position at which it happens and the time at which it happens. Okay, doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Right, so both observers need to measure position and time. So in order to do this, they both need to have a ruler and a clock. So the setup looks like this. <coughs> I'll draw everything from the S perspective. Now that we've fixed alpha, beta, delta, one perspective is enough. So he has got a ruler okay, to measure length. And he's got a clock to measure time. Okay? The S prime observer likewise has a ruler to measure length and a clock to measure time. But according to the S observer, the S prime ruler is contracted and his clock is time dilated, going slow. So that's the original situation. Now something happens at time t. So at time t, what does the same situation look like? So here's S again. Okay, he's got a, a long ruler. Okay. okay, and he's got a clock which is measuring the time t. Right? Now, he sees an event at position x, okay? So, on his ruler, something happens over here, and he measures the time at which, it, the position at which it happens, and it happens at position x. Okay? So, that's it for s. Now, s prime, in the meantime, s prime has moved, right? So, s prime will have moved somewhere over here. And he's got a clock here. And his clock will be measuring the time t prime, which is beta times t, time dilation. Right? And his ruler will look like this. And he is moving. And he needs to look at his ruler and see what position he measures here, x prime. 
Right? So we'll do positions first and then we'll work out times. Okay, let me call this one t prime 1. You'll see why in a minute. Okay, right. So first of all, what is x prime? Well, the distance between the edges of the rulers here is equal to the speed at which he travels, which is u, times the time for which he has traveled, which is t. Right? So this distance here is ut. So this distance here is therefore position x minus ut. So you might think, therefore, comparing these two, that you'll get x prime is equal to x minus ut. Now that's what the Galilean transformation thinks it is, but that's not right, because the ruler is length contracted. Right? And if you try and imagine, suppose that I'm measuring a distance of 2 here on a normal ruler, okay? then on a length contracted ruler, all of the dots are squished up together, so you'll measure a bigger length, like 3. Okay? So because the ruler is contracted, the distance you measure is actually bigger by the inverse factor. Okay? So therefore this will be this divided by beta. Okay? Because the ruler is contracted, the distance you measure is bigger by the same factor. Okay? So 1 over beta. And as I've defined, 1 over beta is what we call gamma, so therefore this is equal to gamma times x minus ut. So that's the first equation of the Lorentz transformation. It tells you how does the measurement of position of s prime depend upon the measurement of position of s. Okay? And it's exactly the same as the Galilean transformation, except for this parameter gamma here. Right, so now we need to do the same thing with time. Time is a bit more tricky. Let me go through it slowly. Okay. The reason time is tricky is because it's not simple, it's not this simple. t prime is beta times t. Right? It's not, that's not the right answer. The reason it's not the right answer is because s prime needs to measure the time of this event over here. Now in order to do that, s prime will need to have a second clock at the position of the event. Right? So he will need to have another clock here. Right? In fact, S also needs another clock here, but according to S, his clocks are synchronized, so they show the same time, so it doesn't matter. Right? But according to S, the S prime clocks will not be synchronized. Right? The second S prime clock, sorry, this diagram is getting rather crowded. The second S prime clock will show a sign time T2 prime, which is equal to T1 prime, and then this one is ahead, so it's behind in time, so minus delta. Okay? So therefore, the time that S prime measures for the event, which is T prime, which is T2 prime, as I've called it there, right, is equal to, going on the diagram, T1 prime minus delta, T1 prime is just beta times T, as we've said. Okay. And what's delta? Delta, I rubbed it off. Okay. Let me write it up here. Okay. The formula for delta was it was equal to U times L divided by C squared, where L is the distance between the clocks in the rest frame. Okay. So in this case, L here is x prime, the distance between the clocks. So this is beta t minus u over c squared times x prime. Okay. So this is beta times t minus u over c squared. You put in the formula for x prime, which is gamma times x minus u times t. Okay. So now we need to simplify this equation. 
Okay, I'll, I'll go backwards. Okay, so I, I'm nearly at the end, so I think 10 minutes was about right. Okay. So, what's this? Well, let's put the T parts and the X parts separately. So the T parts, I've got beta from here, and then from here I've got plus gamma times u squared over c squared. Okay? And the x part is minus gamma times u over c squared. Now I use a cunning trick. We defined that gamma was just 1 over beta, right? So therefore, beta times gamma is just equal to 1. Gamma was defined as 1 over beta, so beta times gamma is 1. So I can multiply by 1 here. In other words, I can write this as t times gamma times beta squared plus u squared over c squared. Minus the same thing. So what I've done is I've multiplied the first term by beta times gamma, and that allows me to take gamma outside. Okay? And then last line, beta squared, if you look at the definition, it's just 1 minus u squared over c squared. Okay? So therefore, the u squared over c squared nicely cancel, and you get that t prime is equal to gamma times t minus u over c squared x. And that's it. the end. Okay, so just let me write it up. Summary. So what's the Lorentz transformation? It says that x prime is equal to this factor gamma times x minus ut. And it says that t prime is equal to gamma times t minus u over c squared times x. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. We've, we've covered an awful lot of content in this lecture. There's been a lot of new ideas, okay? So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks exploring these new ideas. So next time, we're going to focus on what does the Lorentz transformation actually mean, okay? After that, we're going to talk about experiments, right? So can you actually experimentally measure the length contraction effect or the time dilation effect? You can. So I'll tell you how you can measure it experimentally. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about what the consequences are for Newton's laws. Okay. Thank you.